to another episode of Talking Kotlin. Glad that you decided to join us today. Um, my name is still Seb, and I'm still joined by my lovely co-host, Hadi. Hey, Hadi, how are you? I'm good. You sure sound like it. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, d- you know what I did? I, I, uh, I, I, I sat through nine seasons of Suits over the Christmas holidays. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of myself. Uh, does does that mean that we can expect some word lawyering and oh um, my god there's going to be a whole hell of a lot of collusion going on i'm telling you that um (laughs) but uh yeah how how you been how's your christmas vacation been that actually you know what we've got five guests today i'm not really (laughs) we don't have enough time to hear about how you've been seb uh why don't we bring on the guests that sounds like an excellent idea, because as you said, uh, we have a full house today uh, since we are talking about the Kotlin Foundation. So we are joined today um, by Xenia, Trisha, Kevin, Jeffrey, and Charles. Hey, folks, welcome to the show. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hello. I always love doing that because I'm sure that the the video editors are going to have a, a fun time trying to cram everybody on screen at the same time as they as they wave and say hi. Um, yeah, I, I think it probably makes sense for us to uh, give each of you a, a quick chance to to introduce yourself before we dive into uh, a discussion about a whole bunch of things. Um, so why don't we just start off in the order that I can see you folks, starting with Charles. Yeah, I'm Charles Anderson. Uh, I work for Shopify, and I'm on the ecosystem committee. I'm on our retail division. I work on our point of sale system mostly. We use Kotlin for um, KMM mostly to multi-platform our point of sale app and a bunch of other apps within the Shopify ecosystem. I'm Ksenia Schneeves, and I'm the Kotlin education advocate at JetBrains, uh, and I'm on the Kotlin. Uh, Foundation Education Committee. I'm Kevin Galligan. I am the technology partner of a company called TouchLab. Um, we got involved with KMM very early. Uh, I guess you could call me the the Kotlin obsessive. Uh, do a fair bit of open source, a lot of client work. It's a services business. Uh, we're now kind of working with teams that are putting this in production uh, and helping them to get that out there. Um, and I'm on the ecosystem committee. You know, we also do a lot of um, conference stuff and all those things. So, Hi, I'm Jeffrey Van Gogh. I'm Director of Engineering at Google. I'm on the board of the Kotlin Foundation as well as from the Language Committee and Operating Committee. Hello, I'm Trisha G. I am a Lead Developer Advocate for Gradle. Um, I'm on the uh, Kotlin Foundation Education Committee and I'm actually not representing Gradle Build Tool per se, but um, I do a lot of stuff around developer productivity. So of course, we all know that Kotlin's like a productive language. So that's kind of where we're going with that, really. Awesome. Thank you so much. Welcome to the show. Yeah, and my name is Hardy, and I hold the grudge against people that say KMM instead of KMP. Not <laughs> naming any names, Kevin and Charles, but, you know, we already killed that KMM stuff. Can you please stop saying it? <laughs> edit this bloody thing and take it out. But anyway, yes, all of you, welcome to the show. Uh, and uh, we realized that uh, we were talking with uh, Seb the other day, and we th- we're like, you know, we, we keep giving out these doing these shows where we're giving out rewards around uh, rewards that the Kotlin Foundation has given to people. And we're like, we've never, ever done a show about what the Kotlin Foundation is. And um, given that uh, this is a beautiful time because we're going to have uh, some announcements around the annual reports and and things around the Kotlin Foundation, we thought, why not also record a show and bring some of the folks? There's so many folks now involved in the foundation. So we we picked the best of the best. That's not going to... No, other people are going to listen to this, Hardy. All right. We picked a few representatives of the Kotlin Foundation, and uh, here you are that are going to give us a little bit of insight into what this whole thing is. And I'm going to kick it off with a very, very simple question. What does the foundation do? Because it's really not clear to many people. Floor is open. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe, you know, Jeffrey as as one of the folks that has been there probably the longest, if not from day one, maybe you want to... Yeah, I'd say maybe day minus 100 even. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. so the, the foundation, we actually started out with a smaller scope than it is today. Uh, so the foundation was created in 2017 when Google and JetBrains announced support for Kotlin on Android. Um, because now it was not just JetBrains involved, we wanted to make sure that it was run through a nonprofit and uh, like make sure that the language evolves correctly. 
so in 2017, when the foundation was created, there were really three things that the foundation was in charge of. Uh, one, which is the trademark, uh, legal stuff, making sure that nobody abuses the name Kotlin and confuses folks what Kotlin is. And then two other things. One is uh, language evolution. So uh, I want to make sure people can rely on the language from version to version, that they don't get breaking changes all the time. Um, and the third is also language evolution, but it's like new features being added. And we separated those on purpose. Uh, some other nonprofit language uh, organizations uh, do everything designed by committee. And we didn't want that. Um, it can slow down development. Uh, we want to make sure we can evolve the language at the same time, not break existing users. So that's why we split those in two. Uh, so there's uh, the language committee who is in charge of approving breaking changes and deprecations. Uh, and that's a committee. Uh, there's people from Google, JetBrains, and uh, uh, independent director uh, who have to approve these. And then the, uh, the foundation assigns the lead language designer, and that's a single person. And, um, that person is in charge of approving any new features. Uh, and so by having this balance, we can still evolve the language pretty quickly, test out new features, and, and uh, vet them, uh, while at the same time making sure people can trust that the language won't break them from release to release. Uh, so that's how we started in 2017. Those were the three pillars that the foundation owned. Uh, and then last year at KotlinConf, we announced that we were expanding the scope of the foundation. Uh, and we did a couple of things. We brought in additional members, um, and then we added new tasks to the, committee, uh, to the foundation. Um, one is education, and the other one is ecosystem. Yeah, and, and I think we'll dive into those, uh, but it, uh, a brief history of how it started. So one of the things you mentioned is that the Kotlin Foundation was one of the goals was to prevent uh, breaking changes, right? Yep. Um, so does anyone know if there's a Scala Foundation? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Seb, <laughs> no question. Off, off, to a, off to a strong start. Um, yeah, so obviously there's, there's still, there was a, a decision made um, to, to do this, uh, like to do these kind of tasks under a foundation rather than some other construct. So, so I'm just curious, why was there a foundation needed particularly, right? Yeah. So when when we announced uh, Google support for a Kotlin on Android, uh, we want to make sure that the language evolves well. And like we, JetBrains has been a great partner for Google for a long time, right? Like in Android Studio is based on, on on IntelliJ, and it's working well. Um, but taking a big step, having a language part of the whole ecosystem that was a big step. We want to make sure that like, we can make sure that language evolves well. Uh, and uh, the community has some say in that. And that's why we decided to work on, on the foundation. So you the kind of the in, entire story uh, behind the foundation um, started out, as you said, in, in the area of like 2017. So can you maybe take us back and and like, Tell us a little bit about why you or why Google and JetBrains together felt that this was the time to get the the JetBrains Foundation set up. What kind of was the was the motivation and and kind of what was the story there? Sure. Uh, so if you think back to the the mid two thousand tens, the way to write apps on Android was using the Java programming language. Uh, most Android devices were still on Java version six, so that means you don't even have lambdas. Um, and this was like very verbose code. Uh, and we started hearing from our customers that they wanted something better. And people already started adopting Kotlin without Google officially supporting it. Um, and then, of course, at the same time, us building Android Studio, we were starting to use Kotlin as the IntelliJ code base started using Kotlin. And so a whole bunch was like, hey, this Kotlin stuff is really powerful and it's really helpful. Um, and so it was kind of a grassroots effort with a bunch of programming language folks at Google trying to convince directors and VPs that we should really uh, adopt Kotlin. Uh, and it wasn't until the, the end of 2016 that we convinced our director and VP to actually spend their holiday break to do some coding. Uh, and so they, they tried Kotlin, and they liked it a lot. And so when they came back from the holiday break, they're like, we should go for this. Uh, and so in early 2017, uh, we started the discussions with JetBrains to see what we could do. Um, and like we really wanted to announce this at, Kotli, uh, at Google I.O. in 2017. Uh, and so as part of those discussions, we're like, hey, how do we make sure that the language evolves well? And that's why we decided to create the foundation. 
Uh, I think technically it wasn't until early 2018 that we actually created the foundation. Um, turns out starting a foundation is a lot of work. You need to talk to a lot of lawyers, write bylaws, make sure that it's okay with the IRS and everything. So it, it took quite a while to get this done. Yeah, that, that's one, one of the reasons for that is because I hadn't watched nine, nine seasons of Suits. If I had, I think would have <laughs> accelerated things a little bit more. Uh, so uh, I, we can go back to the to the history a little bit uh, later on, but I want to bring some other folks in because you know recently we have, uh, and I say we because I didn't. I, I'm also on the foundation, um, but I'm trying to act as as as. What am I acting as now? Apart from, don't say it, uh, n not a guest. Uh, we, <laughs> I wasn't saying that. Uh, we expanded the charter to include a bunch of other things. And that's where we've brought uh, more folks in, such as yourself, Charles, Xenia, uh, Kevin, and, and Tricia. So let's touch a little bit on that expansion of the charter. And one of the first things we want to focus on is the ecosystem committee. So who wants to jump on board there and kind of tell us a little bit about what this uh, ecosystem committee is at, at the foundation? Okay. Um, the ecosystem committee is, uh, its goal is, is to um, expand, expand the ecosystem, expand awareness of the platform. Um, I would say specifically to to try to get more folks involved in, in the open source uh, part of the ecosystem and contributions and, and to grow uh, participation uh, uh, out in the technical world, right? Like uh, left to its own devices, these things are sort of self-forming. So to, uh, and they do, but to have, have a, an entity that's associated more officially with the language and, and the entities working on it uh, provides like a conduit and a, and a better you know, communication effort there. Um, the ecosystem committee has, I guess, most publicly recently, and it's fresh in the mind because we're talking about it a lot. Is, is the open source grant program that um, went on last year, and, and open source developers could submit their their projects for grants to uh, offer incentives for continuing development and awareness and uh, things like that. So it, it is essentially um, putting together efforts to to help. Uh, increase the grow the ecosystem and grow the communication between the ecosystem and the entities that are working on on the platforms. If that summarizes it, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just it's it's trying to be strategic about about working with the ecosystem, the you know the open source community, and you know growing it, growing and growing the open source community's awareness of Kotlin. You know, <clears throat> Jeffrey talked ab about how the grassroots effort within lots of companies including Google is how Kotlin got, you know, brought into the state it is now. Well, there's, there's, there's only so far that can go. And the ecosystem committee is, is some of the work trying to kind of push, push another direction to get more awareness. You know, you said strategically working with the community. Let, let's, let's break that down into, into words we could understand. How does that actually translate into real world actions uh, and what is it that we kind of expect from the community? Because I know that some of the focus around the ecosystem is primarily targeted at multi-platform libraries, uh, which is where we really want to uh, grow Kotlin. But what does that mean? Like, how do you work with, with the community? Do you kind of see a need and tell the community to fill a need? How, how does it work? It changes year to year uh kevin and i are both relatively new to the committee but in in our discussions with the larger committee and in seeing how the the group has worked in the past a lot of it has to do with where are the areas of growth within kotlin as you identified kotlin multi-platform is is a lot of the effort these days from both JetBrains, google and a lot of the other uh groups using it. And so in trying to find the places where good open source work is being done and encouraging people to focus their, their work on that area, we can put out uh, recommendations for these are the preferred ways to do things. These are preferred ways not to do things. You know, we can, we can highlight stuff like that for the community and help kind of guide 
the the world a little bit uh, as much as developers listen to foundations and stuff. Uh, and how has that taken shape so far? Specifically with the you know the grant program from last year, it, you know there is there is a specific thing of like you know these these folks will, you can apply and some folks will be chosen to to receive a grant. But more broadly, it is it is raising awareness of um, the intention that, that like the Kotlin ecosystem, we definitely want these, especially in Kotlin multi-platform, specifically to grow. So a lot of the grant applications were really focused on. Uh, there's an, there's maybe an Android thing, and, and it's it putting in the effort to to grow it into the multi-platform space. So it, it is um, it's signaling that this is something that the the uh, the the folks making Kotlin, the Kotlin Foundation, and, and generally where we want this to go, because there's there really needs to be this is growing, but it's raising awareness of this and expanding. Um, what's available for developers using the tools because it, it, it is any beginning ecosystem has a chicken and egg problem where it's like you have this new thing and it sounds great, but you have nothing that supports it and all the kind of stuff. So it is, I think that would be a very specific case of, of where that has been used. Now, uh, there is there is a, a counterpoint to that, which is the foundation is, is kind of a neutral ent entity. So there is there has to be concern with not specifically saying, well, you should definitely use this and don't use that, that kind of thing. There's, there's a, um, th that effort is, is really kind of delegated to other folks. But part of the the ecosystem's discussion is like, well, who should be talking about these things and trying to go find those folks like, hey, you know, you should really be, um, this group should really be maybe talking about these libraries or giving best practice advice and we can discuss what we think that is, but who's best to really handle that and and not quite delegating it, but but saying, okay, then, then you know, maybe Google should talk about this, and JetBrains should talk about this, and, and folks like us should talk about that, and and uh, you know, Shopify should talk about certain like that kind of stuff, rather than the because the ecosystem committee has has a need to not pick sides too much, <laughs> that kind of thing too. So, but I, I I believe that also, and you can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong here, but also one of the uh, the goals of the ecosystem committee is to to help people with kind of uh, a little bit of guidance as to how uh, to to like structure and and evolve the libraries that they can build uh, in a way that is like maintainable and kind of follows some of the the, the spirit of Kotlin. Would that be right to say? Ah, uh, yeah, you're. <laughs> I would say you're definitely asking the questions that lead to to where this is going. Um, and that slipped my mind. Yeah, that is an ongoing discussion now, and and there is. Um, Open source uh, library design and, and publishing recommendations that are that are being discussed and worked on to um, to to definitely make that that process better and 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 more or more standard and recognize what's good practice and what's not good practice and it's going to be uh, useful for library publishers and especially a lot of the folks doing it maybe haven't done a lot of that before so uh, there that's definitely something that's going on now and and hopefully will be. Um, Coming out in, in volume soon, uh, and we'll see how that goes. And one of the key points you mentioned is you don't want to be the, you know, the entity that recommends what library to use, right? Because you want to kind of foster um, an, an open ecosystem where, you know, different library authors can, can create their libraries and not, you know, developers looking for solutions don't have to come and necessarily use exactly what Microsoft, sorry, did I say Microsoft? I mean, the Kotlin Foundation uh, tells them to use. How how do you balance that? And I know that, you know, both from the Google side and from the JetBrains side, this is a balance play that we have as well. How do you balance that with people saying, I just want a logging solution, or I just want X, or I just want Y. Tell me what I should use. The grant program is meant, you know, identifies you know the 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 strong examples for what you know the community can can look to for you know structure and you know well well maintained libraries and things like that but but we do we 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 try to separate that part of the the ecosystem from actually for making a recommendation because there's there's that's you know the foundation is neutral in, in, in those kinds of things. We don't want to be recommending a library where someone will say, well, I can't, that's, that is corporate endorsed by someone that I, that I don't agree with. And so we, we don't, that's, 
that's just not part of the program. Um, it's it's much more about making sure that people see the the overall arc of what Kotlin wants wants to be headed towards for structure and interaction with a library long term. And so recommendations are are other people's responsibilities, and we 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 do our best in the ecosystem committee to show people that difference of. You know, there are, there are lots of places to go look for a great logging solution. There's not as many places to go look for a great Kotlin architecture. And we want to recommend that. So uh, as we can see, there's already a lot of complexity going on within one committee. Uh, but we actually have representatives here of, of another committee, which is our, which is our education committee. Um, so I'd, I'd love to dive uh, a little bit into this. Uh, and Trisha or, or Xenia, maybe um, you could give us kind of like a, a brief overview of um, why the education committee exists and what kind of its goal is. Oh, we, we kind of uh, define this fancy top level goal and we have some activities that I'll describe later. The, the fancy goal sounds uh, like fostering the next generation of developers uh, with the help of uh, the Kotlin language ecosystem. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Um, You've got to tell us the KPIs that go with that, but okay, continue. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the actual things are uh, much more clear. <laughs> and what we've been doing, we've been promoting Kotlin in academia for quite some time. And one of the things that's out there already available for educators is a programming in Kotlin course. The materials um, any educator can just download and reuse, including the slides with speaker notes, uh, homeworks, uh, tests, and everything a person needs to launch their own uh, Kotlin course. Uh, that's what, one thing that we have, and uh, this goes in the direction of working with educators. Uh, we see educators as our uh, main target group. Uh, and we have a couple more activities we've started last year. One is uh, the Google Summer of Code and our participation as uh, the Kotlin Foundation. So we had uh, four projects. We, we had four successfully completed projects within uh, GSOC last year. We had mentors from Google, uh, JetBrains, Gradle, working on these projects together with uh, students who wanted to know more about open source development. And we actually got some, um, I think, some pretty useful libraries out of this and some pretty useful contributions to, uh, to the language eventually. So that was... Um, Another thing, and we also, uh, we've been running uh, the Kotlin multi-platform contest for students that is soon going to be wrapped up. Uh, actually, in two days, we're announcing uh, the winners. And that's a, co a contest for students and recent graduates where they have a chance to build a project using Kotlin multi-platform technology and win a trip to KotlinCon. And... Um, these are three things that we've already been doing and we'll plan some more for the next year. So I have a follow-up question regarding academia. You said that you know our target audience is academia and you mentioned the course on programming in Kotlin. Do I understand correctly also that one of the goals is to essentially get academia to use Kotlin as the language to teach programming concepts more so than you know, having a course on Kotlin? Yes, that's that's the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal would be to have Kotlin a default language for computer science 101 courses. And we do have these courses already. And in some top universities of the world, there are uh, educators teaching Kotlin as the introductory computer science language. And that's our primary goal, yes. That's excellent. Which top universities? Uh, it's uh, University of Chicago Urbana-Champaign, for example. This is one of the most, uh, the, the highest level universities out there. That's where they have a really huge course teaching, I think, thousands of students in one semester with uh, several dozen uh, assistant educators 
assistant, the, the main uh, person who, who does the course, we actually had a live stream with them, with this person a couple years ago, and it's out there on our Coffin YouTube channel. Uh, yeah, so, and there is an entire playlist with interviews with such educators. And if I'm not mistaken, the Imperial College London also uh, has adopted yes. Kotlin, right? Yes, that's right. One yes. of the top universities in the UK. And uh, actually in the world as well, right? Yeah, and in the world. Yeah. And we've been working with them uh, quite a lot. Yes, actually. Nice. So I, I have a question for, uh, for you, Trisha. Because I, I think you, especially from the from the education perspective, you you bring a, a bit of a different perspective because uh, you are a, a Java champion, right? Like you're, Shh, you're... don't tell anyone. Ah! <laughs> um, so so now that obviously makes me curious. Um, where where do you see um, Kotlin as as having a, a presence in in education, or maybe where do you see like Kotlin overall from from that perspective? That's a good question. Uh, I've got lots of things to say to that. Um, I think, I mean, Java is the language that I've been working with for the longest. And it's the one I did at university, which is a long time ago, and spent a lot of time doing stuff with. Um, in fact, my uh, move from my previous position to this position means it's actually freed me up to do more Kotlin because before I was doing a lot more Java type stuff when I was doing Java advocacy. Um, so it was kind of cool to I had a personal interest in, in spending more time looking at Kotlin and Kotlin developers and what are they doing and like how does it compare to perhaps the Java community. But overall, it's because like I feel very strongly about the about the JVM. Now, I know that Kotlin is not just about the JVM, but I personally have an opinion that the fact that the JVM supports multiple languages is one of the things which makes it a very powerful platform. So me being interested in Kotlin and having a look at the Kotlin community and getting involved with that doesn't feel like betraying Java as such. It feels like opening opening up the opportunities. Um, and it, it, this ties in a bit to the Kotlin and education stuff, which is kind of why I wanted to join that committee specifically, because I'm, I love programming. Programming is cool. There's a lot of space for programmers. There's a lot of roles for technologists. And we don't need to fight over, like, is Java better than Kotlin? Is JavaScript better? All these different things. What I want to do is I, I want, what I would love is for anyone who's interested in playing with computers to find the tool set that works for them, that appeals to them, that allows them to get into technology. And like, for me, that happened to be Java because I was in the right time at the right place. But I actually like Kotlin as a language to learn to program because it is a bit simpler, let's say. It is a bit more streamlined, but it also doesn't doesn't stop you from switching to other languages if you want to. And polyglot programming is much more is much more common these days. And fighting between different JVM languages seems a bit dumb to me. Although obviously like Hattie's comment on Scala was a little bit on point. Um <laughs> but there's room for all of us. It's all good. I had a good day, a good time at Scala Days in Madrid the other day. Um so yes, so I just I think that it's really I think it's important to have lots of different types of languages that that because there's enough space for all of us and to be able to appeal to different people who want to get into technology with with tools that suit them. I I have a soundbite. You know we're doing these little soundbites step for like, you know, selling the episode and like thumbnails I have a soundbite. I actually think Kotlin is a better language for learning to program. Trisha G, Java champion. I <laughs> perfect soundbite. Perfect. I, I love it. I love it. And I was Thanks, just Trisha. talking to before this call, I was just talking to Brian Getz about Java concurrency stuff. And now he's going to be like, but Trisha, we're working so hard to make Java a more approachable language. Like, yes, it's fine for everybody. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't matter. It, it not none of this matters at the end of the day. It's all AI now. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know, I'm, so, a, I'm a little I'm a little surprised, Hardy, that you did not jump on that like JavaScript mention. I I really am. You've you've grown. I, as I a made person. a promise. I made a promise yeah. never to joke about JavaScript again. I've I was going to say like but, I I'll fight about JavaScript, for a second, <laughs> but that's not a, that's that's not official with uh, the in any way with the ecosystem committee. <laughs> you know, when I used to do, here's a funny story for you. When I used to do JavaScript uh, back in the days, like I, I, I went from C Sharp and .NET to doing JavaScript. And oh, I was I'm so a, sorry. I was an MVP uh, for C Sharp, uh, which is like Microsoft's recognized program. 
And uh, my MVP lead said to me, she's like, you're doing too much JavaScript. Microsoft doesn't do JavaScript. We, we can't really like fit you in into a category. Can you stop doing JavaScript? And two years later, here we are, <laughs> you know, two years later after I stopped being an MVP, it's all, it was all about JavaScript. I, I know I kicked this all off. It was all me. If I hadn't started doing JavaScript, none of this would have happened. But anyway, <laughs> so um, I have. Can, can I, I? I I do just want to want to have like one more one more point on the on the subject of just generally bringing Kotlin into education because now now we've heard that there's like uh like large and and high ranking universities but but I'm also curious about just just a little bit about the breadth right of of like how how many universities have have adopted in uh Kotlin in education in in one way or another or or how we're um how that's going because you you did say there's like we there's pre-made uh courses or courseware for the educators um supported by the by the education uh committee uh and so forth so maybe you can just expand a little bit on on that subject still um yeah so our course has been out for uh ZZ course materials they've been out for about half a year and uh since that time several hundred people at least downloaded the materials and I know we have um, a Slack channel for educators and I know that some of them have already shared uh, th these slides and some photos from the courses where they actually use the slides. So uh, that's, uh, that's uh, related to that course. Uh, but usually top tier universities won't take uh, this, the pre-made slides and just read them. So with, with this resource, we, uh, we see it as an aid to those who want to launch a Kotlin course from scratch. But of course, this is a complete course that's currently being uh, taught at two of the JetBrains partner universities uh, on Cyprus and uh, the uh, the one in Bremen. Uh, so yeah, that's a complete course, but uh, many of the educators prefer to, to build their own courses. And uh, for that, I count the stats, not scientifically uh, and statistically correct, but I just take a look at the top universities and their course offerings each year. So uh, it grows each year. It doubles. And now I know that there are over 300 universities that from the top ranking universities that teach Kotlin. So uh, yeah, it, it grows. And uh, we do have uh, the kotlinlang.org slash education page where an educator uh, who teaches Kotlin can submit their uh, institution and uh, get a t-shirt. <laughs> cool. So I want to loop back Jeffrey in. Or loop Jeffrey back in. I'm still here. Hi, Jeffrey. Uh, I, I let, let's go. Let's talk about the real substance in all of this, right? Um, I mean, education, all of that. Let's talk about the monies. Uh, <laughs> so, I hear that the foundation is looking for new members. Why? Yeah, absolutely. Well, your money is one thing, not the only thing. Uh, I think that, as you can hear, we're doing a lot of new things, right? And that requires a lot of people to help out. Uh, a lot of volunteering and um, so we're looking for people to help out like it cannot just be Google and JetBrains driving this right this is a thriving ecosystem with a great community and so that's why we started adding new members uh, last year we added three members Gradle Shopify and TouchLab and all three have been super helpful and like are very active in the different committees uh, as you can see here uh, and so uh, we're looking for new members that will help out grow the community but of course do that, we also need funds to do things like the grants program and the student contest. Um, and so, yes, there is some money involved um, compared to some other foundations, language foundations. It's not a lot, um, but yeah, there is definitely uh, a, a membership fee. And and I want to stress this point, you know, because we've seen you and I both know that we've seen some reports of certain foundations where there's operating costs uh, that go towards uh, employees of the foundation, etc. In the case of Kotlin Foundation, there is no payroll. There are no employees. Like all of the work that is being done is by volunteers, right? Yeah, we the, there's one exception, the independent director who helps vet language community breaking changes. They, they get uh, paid for their services. It's not a payroll. Uh, but that's the only only person in the foundation who gets uh, some some uh, monetary fee. The rest is all volunteer work. 
And so even though that, you know, and ma many of the folks on this call, such as Charles, Kevin, uh, Xenia, Trisha, all are volunteering uh, on the multiple committees and, and putting in hours of their their time to to help drive this, which is very much appreciated. And so what are we looking for in terms of expansion uh, in, in regards to the foundation? Uh, do we have different levels of uh, sponsorship? So we have two level, two tiers. There is uh, silver and gold. Uh, so silver is folks who are very more, more often a bit more smaller company, uh, very involved in the Kotlin community, um, and um, and then there's the gold membership gold there, which uh, we expect like a larger company to be participating. In. It's a bit higher fee, um, but th there's a benefit like the gold membership will guarantee a board seat where the silver membership, they, they get one board seat per five members. Um, so that's kind of the distinguish between the tiers. So we do have uh, three people here who, who represent uh, some of the companies that, that joined after the founding members, Google and JetBrains. So I am uh, curious um, from, uh, to, to just hear the perspective uh, from, from Trisha, Kevin and, and Charles about actually why your your companies uh, decided to join and whether you thought it was a good decision, perhaps. Um, the decision for Gradle to join happened before I joined Gradle. But, I mean, it, it just makes sense really for Gradle because not only is Gradle kind of the, the default build tool for Android and therefore Kotlin type apps on Android, but also Gradle uses the Kotlin DSL. So a lot of what we do with it in the Gradle build tool side is is very dependent upon Kotlin as a language. It contributes to the Kotlin community as well. And, you know, we really want to be integrated into, you know, anything which involves decision making around the language or anything that we can do to, to help Kotlin or anything Kotlin can do to sort of help us. So it just makes sense for Gradle to be sort of really part of the, you know, central part of the development of Kotlin as a language. We, uh, you know, we got, I mean, we got involved in Kotlin like very early. Like uh, we, we had the New York meetup in 2014, which nobody even knew what Kotlin was back then. Um, and and the whole company is focused around this. I you know this is uh, for me personally. It's 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 kind of all I do, and we're very focused on Kotlin multi-platform and growing the ecosystem. I've spent a lot of time uh, in the organic ecosystem doing you know doing libraries, doing talking and stuff. So um, and we spent a lot of time working with JetBrains, uh, talking with a lot of the folks at JetBrains. Uh, so to us, it made sense to get very involved hopefully with advocating for the stuff that we um, hear from the folks who are, you know, we're on the ground, like implementing things and dealing with day to day things that are happening and organizations that are pushing this out. We're hearing the stuff that that maybe isn't great. We're we're hearing what people need. And, and it's been amazing to have that access. And just on a personal level, it's just very exciting for me to to say, OK, now we're, we're really in the mainstream here to to help foster this ecosystem and to make it grow, to make it better. So. Uh, for us, it was a no-brainer, and we were really thankful that we were able to do it. Uh, for Shopify, the biggest part was we have invested heavily in KMP, and well done, well done. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, I can learn. Um, I can be taught. Uh, we've invested heavily in it, and it is, you know, it's a give and take to be part of the foundation. We, we, you know, giving back our feedback what you know we are invested heavily and there's a lot of learnings that come with that there's a lot of um good learnings there's a lot of pain points we've experienced in the breadth of users that we have that are a lot of times unique amongst the mobile ecosystem because uh the way you know we're we're dealing with kind of a different subset of distribution than just the broad we're publishing applications kind of world um and how we're using KMP to drive our mobile applications uh, gives us a lot of incentive to have real chances for input. Um, we, you know, and, and, and I think that we bring a particularly strong sense of uh, kind of real world build, build use um, actual APIs and things like that and, and, and the interfaces that are happening and the ability to really direct that in a way that 
it, you know, it's, we, we don't get the only say by any means, but, but we, we can bring our perspective and we can, and we can also hear what's happening and, 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 and hear input from others and, and get more direct, um, line of communication in a way that, that we, we might not otherwise. That's cool. Uh, by the way, are you using uh, KMP, just KMP or KMP with Compose Multiplatform? Uh, right now, we're just using KMP in the projects that I'm aware of. We've done some dabbling in some of our kind of like internal hacking projects um, around Compose. But but we right now, there's nothing official that I know about. Good. That's there's good, still, right? There's still time. But gen- <laughs> there's still time. Gen- generally, it's good, right? Yeah. Yeah, we... we um, no, I literally want you to say the word, it's good, so that I cut good. segments together and I'll say, compose, it's good, right? Yeah. I, you know, uh, you, you're, you can, I can be taught, but I can't be bought that way. It's okay. I could just use AI to imitate your voice. I, I don't even need you anymore. So anyway, uh, we are out of time. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining us. And by the way, we started this episode mentioning that there's an annual report for the Kotlin Foundation, which goes into more details about where we spend the monies and uh, how you can sign up and become part of the foundation. We are actively calling for members because it's for the greater good, or at least it's for Kotlin's good. Uh, so make sure you take a look and, and join. And uh, thank you to Jeffrey, Kevin, Charles, Xenia, Trisha, not only for joining on the episode, but also for all of the work that you put into the Kotlin Foundation. It is very much appreciated. Um, and, you know, I know that Jeffrey, you yourself as a board member and as part of the operating committee, it's a lot of hours that that, that go in. So, so thank you for that. Uh, Seb, you want to wrap up and do your little thumbs up? Uh, I mean, sure. Yeah. So again, also from my side, thank you so much, everybody, uh, for for coming on the show, and of course, also a big thank you to our audience. If you decided to stick around all the way till the end, you are of course appreciated. You would also be appreciated if you only listened to like half the episode, but then you wouldn't hear this part. So there's like a selection bias. Either way, uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode, um, and we of course hope to see you in a future episode. Um, yeah. Like Hadi said. There's a couple of calls to action. Um, the thumbs up and the subscribe button are probably the easiest ones. But again, if you are in an organization that might want to become part of the Kotlin Foundation, uh, it might be worth taking a look at the kotlinfoundation.org website. Seb, what do you think about the people that fall off after the first 50 seconds? Or I have do they no fall way of... on your spectrum of appreciation. I have no way of reaching them realistically, unless we start the episode with a thank you. <laughs> thank you for watching the first 15 seconds yeah um something like that yeah. anyway hope that you'll tune in uh at some point in the future and yeah i suppose all that's left is to wish everyone uh nice Kotlin. take care everybody <laughs>